Hello, my name is Ariel Bierbaum, and I'm excited to be here to share our work on school-centered community development in Baltimore, Maryland. In 2013, the Maryland State Legislature passed an act that created the 21st Century Schools Building Program. This act resulted in over $1 billion for Baltimore to build and or renovate 28 public schools across 25 neighborhoods in the city. The program is run through a collaboration of city agencies, the Public School District, and the Maryland Stadium Authority, a quasi-public authority that was originally formed to build sports stadium and convention centers. The act forced a marriage across these agencies. This was the first time some of them had worked together or even considered school construction a priority. And the initiative also engages philanthropic, nonprofit, and community-based partners. The initiative is notable for three main reasons. First, it's an enormous public investment in school facilities, which is a rarity in the United States. Second, Baltimore City Schools has experienced declining enrollments for many years, and it's actually closing schools in response. Yet they have made the decision to couple these closures with new school construction and renovation in their facilities management plan, which is a really different approach than many other districts in similar situations. And third, it has an expansive vision of school buildings in communities. The act actually explicitly calls out neighborhood revitalization and other non-education goals as a core element of the investment. In light of this last mandate or hallmark, our study situates the program in light of more traditional community and neighborhood development efforts. City agencies responsible for planning or housing, parks and recreation, they have obvious involvement in community neighborhood development activities. But this case challenges us to ask questions about what happens when a school district enters the fray of neighborhood change through significant school building investments and an aggressive vision for community schools. So in our study, we examine some of the challenges of the cross-sector collaborative governance model and raise questions about how we currently understand both community schools and community development. Community development is a process of place and people-based initiatives that aim to provide resources to economically disadvantaged and disinvested communities. Schools are a vital component of community development. They help build social and political capital, they provide services, and they contribute to local economies and housing markets. Yet despite these connections, school and neighborhood improvement efforts have really been viewed as distinct processes in both scholarship and practice. We wanna think about how this huge investment in school buildings and in the community school's infrastructure aligns with theories of community development practice. And so we draw on a framework developed by Dr. Laura Wolf Powers, which identifies three theories of action that drive the diagnoses and interventions for community development in the United States. Norm-centered theories of action focus on building social capital, community trust, and coordination of social services through approaches of comprehensivity. Schools as centers of community really fit within this approach. Market-centered theories of action purport that a lack of public and private capital investment is the driver of neighborhood disadvantage. And here, schools are sort of transformed into neighborhood amenities, and they're used to attract middle-class residents and catalyze economic development. Justice-centered theories of action identify structural inequity as the root cause of neighborhood disadvantage, and consequently argue for a more political and less local or neighborhood-level approach to interventions. For schools, justice-centered interventions may seek to increase parent and community organizing power, especially among parents from backgrounds that have been historically excluded from schools, and they really focus on redressing historic harms and making reparations uh, for wrongs done to, to up to historically marginalized communities. Our study focused on the implementation phase of the 21st Century School Building Program, where including school districts really required added burdens of cross-sector collaboration in policymaking and practice, and it really complicated community development efforts. Likewise, collaborating with city agencies complicated the school building effort for the school district. There were many dimensions to these challenges, but given our limited time, I wanna talk about the one that undergirds all the others. 
We argue that the root of many of the cross-sector challenges was that agencies held divergent and often competing theories of action, ones that actually mapped quite well to the three theories underlying community development, norms, markets, and justice that I just described. So the Maryland Stadium Authority, the financing arm of the initiative, managed from an operating philosophy of buildings on time and under budget. Their approach and metrics of success really focused on cost effectiveness and efficiencies of scale. The city, through its planning and Department of Recreation and Parks, prioritized the community use of schools and approached the initiative from a philosophy of schools for our neighborhoods and their residents. Planning staff promoted planning schools into already existing plans and connecting to existing community building efforts, reflecting a theory of norms. They facilitated processes um, and helped implement community improvement and beautification projects that was really grounded in community participation and connecting to the existing resident infrastructure. The Department of Housing and Community Development really suggested that the school decisions, the siting decisions for the new schools, were not part, part of broader citywide development discussions, and as a result, it sometimes missed the mark. For them, the district's decision to place many of these new schools in deeply distressed communities limited how they and other community development actors could leverage the school investment with market forces to support neighborhood stability and growth. This department really articulates the theory of markets, where schools are positioned as amenities to be catalysts for private sector investment in already stable or what some people call tipping point neighborhoods. And the district defended their decisions staunchly, and they managed really from a philosophy of schools for our kids. They arguably best embody the theory of justice, and they saw their decisions as a way to meet the district's commitment to racial justice and equitable education, prioritizing sites with the most needs who would benefit from new buildings and enhance community school service programs, and that had been the most historically disadvantaged. This was all a non-negotiable element of their planning. They did not consider neighborhood condition beyond the fact that historically disadvantaged students often lived in historically disadvantaged neighborhoods. They didn't consider other agency strategies or the broader market conditions. They were solely about improving equity and redressing historic harms for their district students. Placing schools in the framework of community development suggests that beyond serving as a hub for bringing services into the school, the school building is situated in a larger neighborhood ecosystem that extends out from the school walls. Schools are place-based community assets, yet in Baltimore what we saw was that connecting the dots across this school building program and other community de development and investments really proved immensely challenging. The lack of alignment and at times really competing approaches to the mission and the metrics for success of the 21st century school building program across these agency actors really challenged the ability of agencies to meet that aspirational goal of creating high quality school buildings, robust community schools, and place-based assets for the broader neighborhood community. I also just want to make a, a last note about the COVID-19 crisis which I feel like we can't ignore in this context, and the extent to which the crisis laid bare, how much schools serve as critical, uh, critical places of the delivery of our social safety net in the United States. So when schools closed in response to COVID, it really was a testament to the efficacy of the community school approach as community school coordinators and family engagement specialists really became a lifeline for so many families in crisis. But some of what we saw was that the community school coordinators who were connected to other kinds of community development or broader neighborhood organizations, they had a different kind of reach and at times more positive and more extensive impact. Um, and so, of course, staff in general were critical and the community school model was really powerful. But COVID also reveals some of the pitfalls of relying on a single public institution when this kind of crisis hits. And it raises critical questions for us about what schools should or should not have to take on. 
but most important, we want to think about how they function as place-based community assets and how does the case of Baltimore and the dynamic nature of this huge school facilities investment project in neighborhoods help us understand better how we can think about and potentially redefine notions of community development and notions of community schools to really maximize the opportunity and connection between school and place. We, of course, have so much more to share about this case, but for now, I'll leave it at that. And I look forward to the questions and discussions in our live session coming up. Thanks so much.